Good afternoon and welcome to the third and final meeting of the Young Women Lead Committee. This is a unique committee that the Parliament is supporting in partnership with Young Women Lead. And that's a leadership project that 38 young women from across Scotland are taking part in. Some are around the table today and others are with us in the public gallery. Welcome. Today's session will run until approximately 3.15 and welcome to those that are watching online. Thank you for your interest in this work. This committee met in February and agreed a topic of inquiry, which is to look at the issue of sexual harassment, in particular as it is faced by girls and young women in schools. After our meeting in April, the committee members wrote to the Scottish Government and have received a written response, which is available on the Young Women's Movement website. At today's meeting, we will be hearing from the Scottish Government officials and the committee will have the opportunity to take evidence from them directly. I would like to welcome our panel today, all from the Scottish Government. We have Sarah Capassi, who, oh, there she is, who is the unit head of the Violence Against Women and Girls Barnhouse Unit. We have Trevor Owen, who is a team leader in Cohesive Communities. We have Phil Alcock, who is a team leader in the Health and Wellbeing Unit, and Sandra Aitken, who is a team leader for Child Protection. The panel have indicated that they're happy to go straight into questions, and so we shall begin. And I would like to ask my Deputy Convener, Alexandra Stevens, to open with the first question. Thank you, Alexandra. Convener. Um, our research found uh, slightly differing understandings across the country of what constituted sexual harassment um, and I'd like to ask the witnesses um, whether they feel more could be done to ensure that schools and teachers have a consistent and clear understanding of what constitutes sexual harassment. Who would like to, who would like to respond? I Phil, Phil Alcock. Hi there. Um, Teachers um, across Scotland are guided by um, the benchmarks and experiences and outcomes which have been published by Education Scotland and they provide um, uh, various stages of understanding that pupils should be at within their, their different stages of education. Um, and we also have guidance available um, on relationships, sexual health and parenthood which is available to, to teachers, which provides a, a framework on, on which they can um, teach our pupils and children, young people within schools. Um, so there is, there is guidance out there, um, but Trevor can give you a bit more information on some of the, the wider guidance on that, that issue as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the point, I think you make a, an interesting point um, about, I suppose, uh, awareness and understanding of se what sexual har harassment constitutes um, more broadly. And it's something we, I think we've been given a lot of thought to in the, in the light of the, the Me Too campaign, um, with people coming forward and obviously talking about their experiences. Um, <clears throat> and through um, our work on the Equally Safe strategy, um, we'll be taking forward a, an awareness raising campaign um, around sexual harassment and sexism. And I think one of the things that we'll be looking to think about is, you know, you know how we're articulating what sexual harassment looks like um, and obviously giving out a consistent message. Um, and we're currently working with Rape Crisis Scotland um, to develop a proposal that will be in part very focused on youth and young people. Um, so I uh, obviously look forward to seeing that work progress and I'm sure you'll have an interest in that. Um, but I suppose more broadly, um, through Equally Safe, we recognise, I think, there is more work to be done in schools. Um, sorry, I'm just hearing myself, hearing myself behind myself, uh, rather unnerving. Um, but uh, think about, I suppose, you know, um, issues around, you know, I suppose, education in schools and understanding of, understanding of consent and healthy relationships. And we're working closely with Rape Crisis Scotland and that, and I'm happy to say a bit more about that later on. Uh, would you like to go any further on that one, Alexandra? Perhaps no, that's from fine. Sarah. Thank You're you. Happy enough. Uh, Sandra and Sarah, is there anything you would like to add to that? Um, 
Um, is this on? Yep. Um, possibly just, I, I know that the committee are looking at just sexual, har sexual harassment, but just broadening it out, I think gender-based violence generally could be better understood. Um, we've just, uh, Scottish Government has um, recently passed the, the Act um, creating a new offence on coercion and control, for example. And um, what we have heard uh, through discussions with um, stakeholders and people with lived experience is that perhaps at school leaver age, is they don't identify with domestic abuse. Um, so I know that the remit is narrow for this committee, but I think it's worth making the point that, you know, something like coercion and control, for example, um, could also um, be better understood um, generally across the board, not just for teachers, um, for students, for, for a, a number of um, individuals that work with children or young people. Um, and that might be something that we take forward in um, any forthcoming campaign to um, raise public awareness about something like, for example, coercion control. Mm -hmm. uh, can I remind you, you don't need to press any buttons. That's me that did that. I, I'm so used to doing that when I'm sitting in the chair in the chamber that I keep forgetting. I've put you all off, sorry. Touch nothing. <laughs> oh, good. Um, nothing really um, to add over and above what my colleague has said about some of the, the broader work happening in the Scottish Government, more broadly about violence in, uh, against women and girls. Um, child protection, obviously, is slightly different in terms of the child protection. Formal processes get triggered at the significant harm level. So um, there's work, I think, probably more broadly around some of the definitions of what that constitutes, and we're looking at refreshing the national guidance for child protection over the course of the next year or so. So I think the scope to incorporate some of the lessons and the, the work that's happening more broadly as part of Equally Safe and some of the other um, things that my colleagues have outlined, but there's nothing else I can really add at this point. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can I say to the panel, same as I, I would say to everyone here, if... Um you wish to come in in the back of any of these questions, just let me know. And for the panel, if you feel you're best placed to respond to any particular question, just indicate and I can call your name. I understand Ruth has a question. Thanks, Convener. Um, we're interested to understand your roles a little bit more um, and also how these policies come about. So I wondered if you'd be able to tell us a little bit more about your respective roles in terms of advising and informing policy decisions. Um, and it'd be great if in your answer you could make um, direct referral to your role in relation to sexual harassment in schools and policies in those areas. Okay, Trevor looks ready to be first up for that one. Um, okay, um, I, um, as, as uh, the convener said, head up the um, Keys of Communities team uh, in the Scottish Government. Um, I, I lead uh, from the Equality Unit um, our work to tackle violence against women and girls. Um, that includes responsibility for coordination um, and implementation of the Equally Safe strategy, um, which you'll be familiar, and the del delivery plan that we published in November. Um, and I suppose um, the advice I, the, in terms of ministerial um, link, I provide advice to um, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities, Angela Constance, um, on these issues for her interests. Um, and I also provide support to the Joint Strategic Board um, that oversees the implementation um, of Equally Safe. And I suppose, um, I mean, obviously I'll let the um, other panel members speak to their particular roles. Um, our particular focus and not looking to duplicate what others are doing very well across the organisation um, is around, I suppose, prevention, early intervention and service provision. In addition to that, um, overall strategic coordination. Um, so uh, that's really where I suppose we're coming from, um, with a very strong focus, I think, on primary prevention and shifting, um, I suppose, the underlying attitudes and structural inequalities um, that, uh, I suppose, create the conditions for vi this type of gender-based violence to flourish. And in relation, I suppose, to sexual harassment, um, I suppose, again, we look at violence against women and girls as a continuum, um, and I think... We do have more work to do um, to sort of look specifically at sexual harassment, but there is some really um, there is some really good developing work going on across the organisation, particularly in the context of workplaces. I mean, we've been linking with our colleagues and fair work on that. Um, so, but I'll I'll perhaps let my colleagues um, talk about about their I suppose their specific roles. 
Um, I work in the Violence Against Women and Girls Justice Unit. We've um, recently taken on um, an added uh, part to that unit as well, looking at children and gender-based violence um, as well. Uh, and I head up the unit. Um, our specific role is looking at victims, predominantly in the justice system, and applying um, what we would say is a, a gendered analysis to the process to see what can be done to improve the experience of victims. Um, who've experienced gender-based violence, um, most notably domestic abuse and sexual assault. Um, I work closely with the Equalities Unit on the Equally Safe Strategy, and uh, our unit helped to develop some of the actions um, under the Justice Strand or the Justice Response and Equally Safe. Um, we provide advice to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Justice predominantly on issues relating to really predominantly victims um, going through the justice system um, in terms of sexual harass harassment in schools specifically, um, is equalities and um, perhaps uh, Phil's team that do more specifically on sexual harassment in schools, but we do have uh, a wider interest in the, the coordination, I guess, across the piece um, from someone who may be in um, young school right the way through to um, university age or, um, or past that, and looking at the trends, I suppose, um, in the statistics at, um, and seeing what they, they are suggesting to us. And I think what we have found recently, for example, is that young people are um, in a category um, which where sexual offending is happening um, uh, quite prolifically. Um, so there's, there's an interest, I guess, there from justice to look at what are the patterns and where where are the age groups that we should be targeting our attention and thereafter where should we be coordinating that with other parts of the government. Um, I would just mention as well, um, uh, we funded a um, toolkit to be produced for universities um, to look at what they could do to embed, uh, essentially embed equally safe throughout the university. Um, so that would be uh, referral pathways, uh, prevention work, campaigns, training for um, people who work within the university, a three-tiered response, so somebody makes a disclosure, what do you do? Um, so that's been a really good bit of work and we're finding a lot of interest from universities about that and colleges. And I believe that that work can link into the, the, the work that's happening in schools. Um, to create that consistent message across the piece so that the, the messages about sexual harassment and beyond are being reinforced throughout. Um, I think I'll stop there. Hi. Um, so as, as the chair um, said at the start, I head up the health and wellbeing team within Learning Directorate. Um, the team's got quite broad responsibility, so we look after um, LGBTI, inclusive education, physical activity, um, school food, free school meals, um, relationships, sexual health and, um, and behavioural policy as well. Um, we work very closely with Education Scotland when we're um, uh, developing guidance and, and resources for teachers because um, our aim is to make sure that um, schools across Scotland have um, the right resource and the right guidance available to them to make sure that they can um, help uh, children and young people within their, their schools. Um, we also do a lot of um, work with um, stakeholder groups to inform policy as it, as it is developed. Um, this is, um, we have a, an overarching group which is chaired by the Deputy First Minister and um, Councillor Stephen McCabe from COSLA. And that's the uh, Scottish Advisory Group on Relationships and Behaviour in Schools. And this, this group um, looks at the wide um, aspect of uh, behaviour guidance and approaches that are taken in schools and involves a lot of key stakeholders such as teaching organisations, um, uh, teaching unions, um, Education Scotland as well as uh, colleagues from local authorities and, um, and other key interest groups. So a lot of the, the work of this group is, is to consider um, the way forward to help and support teachers and um, support our children and young people to make sure that they do have the right resources um, to enable them to, to flourish in, in their learning environments. Um, on the specific, specific issue of sexual harassment, um, as I said previously, we've, we've got guidance on relationships, sexual health and parenthood. Um, that was written in 2014. Um, so in, 
in my view, I think it's, it's ready for a refresh. So uh, we're, we're currently working with um, Education Scotland to, to look at that piece of guidance to see where it can be updated. But there's also um, a project that we're involved with um, that NHS Greater Glasgow Health Board are leading on, which is delivering an online resource for relationships, sexual health and parenthood. Um, and there is a, a web link available where you can input to this work as it develops, so it gives you a chance to, to um, um, inform this, this piece of work as it, as it goes forward. And I'm more than happy to provide that link to the committee members following this meeting. Um, sexual harassment can also come into the anti-bullying um, area of, of policy as well. So in, in November 2017, we published our revised anti-bullying guidance, um, Respect for All, which provides a, a, a national approach for anyone who works with uh, children and young people and gives them um, a very clear guidance and a framework on how to help children who are experienced bullying. And um, when it, it, there's a very fine line between uh, bullying and what be, can become um, an incident that maybe needs to involve the police. So it gives a very clear guidance on, on how um, teachers, parents, and even pupils themselves can, can be supported throughout this process. So, Sexual harassment covers qu quite a number of my different uh, remits. Um, so I have to work very closely with, with colleagues uh, like Trevor and other colleagues who, who are working on delivering um, digital solutions for children because a lot of the, uh, the evidence we're hearing is the prevalence of mobile phones and how that can uh, impact on um, the experience that a young person is experiencing in school. So I work in the protection policy team and um, as a consequence we're, we have a broad programme of improvement that we're working on at the moment, part of which looks at the structural underpinnings of the statutory child protection system. So things like significant case reviews and how um, the relevant bodies um, take cognizance of what's gone wrong if there's been a, a particularly difficult case or a tragic event and how learning gets put back into the system and the sort of, as I said, the, the structural underpinnings of that system. But then we have a lots of broader policy work that we lead on um, in child protection. So, for example, we're the lead for the Child Internet Safety and National Action Plan for the Scottish Government. And part of that involves identifying from a child protection perspective the things that, that are priorities. And we do that in consultation with young people's organisations as well as relevant stakeholders such as Police Scotland, um, local authority, child protection committees and organisations that represent both children's interests and the voice of children and also working across policy areas. So, for example, Syra, Trevor's and, and Phil's to incorporate other policy strands that are relevant to internet safety. So we have some actions that... Um, suggest that we need to work with Education Scotland, for example, around the things that Phil had been talking about, making sure that um, other things that aren't strictly deemed child protection matters, so the broader education side of things are covered in our action plans. Um, we also have responsibility for things such as we are looking at revising the child cruelty legislation to incorporate an offence of um, emotional harm against a child which isn't co currently clearly outlined in Scottish legislation. So we have um, responsibility to be taken forward policy in that respect. Um, we report directly to um, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education um, and other ministers in terms of the work that we're taking forward and we work um, collegiately with other areas of government to represent children's interests, for example, around the recent Domestic Abuse Act, um, our team were responsible for looking at the development of provision around children in that act over and above the provision that was in there for, for adult victims of domestic abuse. So working with um, Women's Aid, for example, and the Power Up, Power Down um, uh, uh, work that had been done by them and the Children's Commissioner to make sure that that's represented from the Scottish Government's perspective in, in legislation and policy. Um, thank you all of you. Um, we've heard a bit about joined up government there, but I know that Katie wants to probe that a bit further. Um, and if you could perhaps nominate one of you to, to answer Katie's question, perhaps in relation to what would be deemed as the lead department. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, so I think you have touched it on uh, with the answer to Ruth's question. Um, if you could expand on 
what measures are taken either by officials or by ministers to ensure that work to tackle sexual harassment in schools is taken forward across different ministerial uh, portfolios, in this case across justice, education and equalities? It looks like Trevor's been nominated. <laughs> I feel obliged. Um, yes. Uh, so um, it's a good question. And I suppose, uh, you know, one is asked of us a lot, uh, how does government join up on these issues? Um, and in a sense, I suppose, um, in one sense, I suppose, there's, the onus rests with the equality unit um, to support that. Um, but I suppose... Um, the message that we try to get across that um, tackling violence against women and girls and indeed tackling sexual harassment um, is everybody's responsibility. Um, and um, I, it doesn't feel like too much of a, a challenge actually to get my colleagues sitting next to me on board. Actually, we, we work very collegiately together and there is a, um, we will all step forward and you know work collaboratively. And there is, I think, that increasing push um, within government um, to work collaboratively across portfolios rather than, I suppose, one part of um, the government being in the lead and taking that responsibility. Um, so I suppose we, we, we would all have different we would all have different parts to play, and I suppose a collective responsibility to work together. Um, but I suppose in terms of where the sort of overall coordination sits. Um, that would sit within the equality unit, but not necessarily in a top-down way, more a sort of supportive um, trying to bring together. But it very much, I suppose, depends on the issue at times as well. Um, so, yes. Um, and I think the Equally Safe Delivery Plan um, contains a number of actions, um, 118 in total across four different priority areas. And in looking at, I suppose, violence against women and girls across the continuum, um, domestic abuse, rape and sexual assault, um, commercial sexual exploitation, form of, forms of so-called honour-based violence, um, recognising that a number of those actions will in, you know, feed in across the continuum are not necessarily... Um, explicitly isolated to one form, um, I think is an important point that I would want to make. So, for example, the whole schools work that we're supporting, um, Rape Crisis Scotland and Zero Tolerance, um, to take forward, and they're, they're currently pilot, piloting in schools in Scotland, um, would touch on all forms of gender-based violence. So it would include um, consideration of the issues um, that, you know, Phil is, has an interest in in relation to respect for all. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting one and how it's supposed uh, different initiatives cut across um, a whole range of subjects. Um, but we are keen, I think, and I'd, I'd made reference specifically to the sexual harassment campaign. But I know we're, we're also keen to look at, for example, how we can uh, encourage employers to adopt more robust procedures and policies in this area and ensure greater consistency across the sector, as well as work we're taking forward with an organisation called Close the Gap, who I'm sure you'll be familiar with, about developing an equally safe accreditation programme for employers. And again, also, it's not, it's not solely about sexual harassment, it will touch on and it will in be inclusive of issues around sexual harassment, which, as we know, um, <clears throat> is something that really manifests itself in workforces and something we need to really look at. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor. You mentioned um, schools and education, and well, that is a theme that we've been looking at. So I think in that, that regard, we'll take a question from Aleda and a question from Esme, and then if the panel could respond to both questions which are related. Eleanor. Thank you, convener. Um, so I just wanted to ask that given the Scottish Government's commitment to tackling violence against women and, and girls, which we've seen through things such as Equally Safe and the work being done on coercion and control, uh, whether the, the Scottish Parliament ministers are considering the introduction of national guidance on sex and relationship education to be issued to all schools throughout Scotland? Yes, Okay, and my question following on from that would be, what information does the Scottish Government have surrounding the quality of the current sex and relationship education in Scottish schools? Or for example, does it have any documented feedback from the girls and young women and boys that have gone through that education? So, how good is it? And uh, should there be national guidelines that should be adhered to? Phil uh, is rearing to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an, um, so... As I said at the start, we, um, Education Scotland have produced um, a suite of benchmarks 
for post personal and social education. And within these, they, they include um, uh, specific, le specific um, levels where we expect um, different um, age groups to be at within their um, understanding of um, sexual health and, and sexuality. Um, so for, for, for instance, in um, S1 and S3, there is, um, it's that, sorry, I'll just get there, um, it, a specific um, outcome that we, we look for, for learners to be aware of is, I know how to manage situations concerning my sexual health and well-being, and I'm learning to understand what appropriate sexual behaviour is. And then there's also, I know how to access services, information and support. So, so there's... So rather than um, prescribing to teachers what they should teach, the, the, the curriculum in Scotland um, is, a, is a framework. So we, um, it, it is up to schools and teachers how to, to teach based on the needs of their, of their kids in their classroom. But the benchmarks and the experience and outcomes give the teachers a, a guide on where at each level of, of learning a, a pupil should be. Um, and obviously we have the, the, the guidance that I alluded to earlier on, the relationships and sexual health and parenthood guidance as well. Um, with regard to an assessment on current provision, um, Education Scotland on behalf of um, Scottish Ministers uh, have just completed a, a review of personal and social education um, within Scotland. Um, as part of that review, they um, visited 20 secondary schools, 20 primary schools, 10 early learning and care centres and five special schools. Um, that had quite a, a broad remit, but in particular, it, it looked at how the issue of sexual consent is taught within relationships, sexual health and parenthood education um, from early learning through all stages of education. And the PSE review um, wasn't just an exercise in going out and speaking to the teachers, it also involved an element of speaking to the pupils themselves. So to gather the, the thoughts of pupils on, on the education that they're, they're experiencing. Um, so the, the, the visits have just been um, completed and Education Scotland are pulling together that report and um, they're expected to provide that to Scottish ministers in June. Um, when we'll then um, take forward a, a further process of um, engagement and consultation on, on the report findings with um, COSLA, ADES, um, some local authority leads who, who lead on the delivery of personal and social education, but then also um, bring in some third sector organisations as well, so we can gather the thoughts of some third sector organisations on, on uh, the, the report findings and what they would like to see for um, sexual health um, education going forward. Would anyone like to come in? Uh, Esme, Elna, come in again um, before we go on to it. Oh my goodness, this is obviously one that catches the imagination. I uh, will have Esme, then Ruth, then Elna. Just quick questions, please. Okay. Um, it's really good to hear there's been um, that review done, and I think as a committee we'll be really interested to find out um, the results of that in June. But um, it's really good to hear that schools have been... 20 schools across Scotland have been checked. Um, but do you know if any of those schools um, are schools that are choosing not to um, issue PSE or very minimal? And if that review might um, include any data about the correlation between high levels of, um, high levels of education surrounding um, sexual health, sexual behaviour and relationships and violence against girls? Do you, do you know if there'll be any... Or would that just... Come it's, out in June. It, it's, yeah. Take the three questions. I'm, I'm very aware of the time. Esme's obviously been watching Parliament and knows to completely ignore the chair when she says <laughs> quick questions. <laughs> Ruth. In terms of the benchmarking and outcomes that you mentioned against each age group, um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how those were set um, and also who was involved in the decisions around what was deemed to be age appropriate. Eleanor. I just wanted to check in regards to the guidelines and ensuring that you know schools are adhering to them and achieving the levels that are set. Um, is there a way? Is there a method in place for ensuring that what we have is effective? Um, and if it's not effective, is there something that we're doing about it? Is there some plans in the works to 
um, make it effective. Okay, Phil, thank you. Yeah. Um, to take your first question, um, it's too early to say, to be honest with you, the, the review is, has really just been completed uh, towards the end a couple of weeks ago. So I haven't actually seen any of the, the reports that have been undertaken on the, the 55 individual schools. Um, but that will, they will be published as, as part of the, the, the process and, and the uh, PSE review. Um, with regard to benchmarks, um, they were established in 2016 or 2017. I think it was 2017, sorry. Um, education set them, Education Scotland um, set them. Um, I'm not too sure who was involved in that process, but I can certainly check that with Education Scotland colleagues and get back to you on that. Um, with regard to the effectiveness, um, Education Scotland also undertake an inspection duty, so they are the uh, education inspectors on behalf of Scottish ministers, so they will go into schools and, and look at how schools are delivering personal and social education, as well as other aspects of the curriculum and provide a detailed report, which could lead to um, follow-up action if necessary. Okay. Okay, regardless of guidelines and all sorts of things we put in place, things happen. Uh, Jane would like to probe some of that. Thank you, Convener. Um, we've already talked a lot this afternoon about support. Um, given the seriousness of the issue, and as it affects so many women and girls, do you think further actions could be taken by Scottish Government to make sure that there are adequate and appropriate resources in schools to both support young women and that they can use to report any incidents that they may face? Uh, I think perhaps Sarah and Sandra, would that be appropriate for you to come in on that and then maybe a round up from Phil, who's the schools man? <laughs> and certainly talk from a child protection perspective and I think, um, I, I don't think that anyone would pretend that we, we've got every piece of information out there that ought to be there in terms of supporting children and young people. So I, I, I expect that there is more that can be done. Um, I think in terms of child protection instances, and you know, I want to be clear about the sort of um, to segregation of, and not to diminish anyone's experience as less serious, for want of a better phrase, than others, but there are key points by which a, a child protection concern gets raised. And I think schools have fairly well established route ways for a child protection incident. So where there is a, a significant level of harm or an actual physical um, incident, there's, there's well established um, child protection coordinators in every school who would then escalate that to the relevant authorities, be that police or whether that's social work involvement. But in terms of those cases that perhaps fall below that, that threshold, there is already established, um, for example, the Scottish Government Fund child line for support and, and um, advice. But I think there is maybe a piece of work that could look at what other provision there might be for those that don't quite meet a formal um, child protection threshold. And I'll, I'll pass on to other colleagues that are more um, well versed in, in what those are that are short of that, that statutory threshold. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think what I could um, contribute to, to that in terms of support in schools. Um, that isn't specifically, um, we haven't looked at schools in terms of, of, of support, I suppose. I, I might maybe suggest in general, I think any um, institutions where there are young people, um, that there's, there needs to be something that's consistent across the piece in Scotland. Um, the work that I've been involved in is more towards university level. Um, and I suppose I could apply something similar, although of course in school there may be child protection issues as Sandra has raised. Um, but in terms of universities, what, what we're trying to do is, is get the universities to look at what they need to embed systemically throughout um, the institutions. And I think schools are the same. So that might be, um, you know, consistent referral pathways, consistent um, responses, um, so that if there is something that is disclosed or noticed that it's dealt with in a particular um, way that's consistent and, I guess, informed. Um, so I, I don't think I can add more than that. I'll maybe pass over to Phil. Is that perhaps, Phil, back to the national guidelines that we were talking about earlier? Yes. Yeah, so it's an element of that, but also an element of providing um, additional resources available to teachers. Um, so a lot of the resources we make available through um, the National Improvement Hub, which is hosted by Education Scotland, 
but also through GLOW, which is a specific um, school's intranet type system, which allows teachers to um, post stuff on, on, to allow sharing of best practice and to share ideas and have a discussion on how to help children and young people. Um, one of the organisations that um, we fund is Respect Me, and there are um, national organisation that's um, working um, with schools and anyone who works with children on anti-bullying um, measures and, and training for, for teachers in, in that respect. But we've, um, uh, we're supporting a, a partnership that's being led by Respect Me and a range of partners, including um, Rape Crisis Scotland, Zero Tolerance and SEOP, which is um, aiming to raise the awareness of um, gender-based issues from bullying to harassment and violence. So that's, it's, it's one of the areas where we can um, work with our third sector partners to, to really um, support and help children and young people in our schools who need it. But our role is to, is to give them the, the framework and the guidance to enable them to do that. Um, so that's where we're, that's just a, a mm -hmm. hint, that's just some of the work that we're doing. I mean, I can provide more information to the committee after this session if, if that would be... Uh, uh, in addition, actually, just in, in terms of following up on some of that, we're at a very early stage, and it, it's, it's again, um, moves more into sort of the category of offending rather than harassment, although there's an argument about the level of harassment that should be offending and so on, but um, the Scottish Government has established an expert group that is looking at children who are... Um, offending against other children, for want of a better phrase, online. So there's clearly an online dynamic to a lot of the harassment. And um, we were aware last year that figures about children offending against other children had risen um, quite exponentially. And so, as I say, this group is at its very early stage. It's not at the point where it's making any or drawing any conclusions as yet. But part of that is looking at what needs to be in place in terms of supporting both those children that are victims of the online offending um, uh, and that's based around sexual offending and those children that are committing that type of offending and part key of that is, is working with young people themselves who have either been um, involved in that behaviour or subject to that behaviour and so there may be some um, very interesting lessons to draw from that but as I say it's still at a very early stage but it's, it's certainly something that's under um, serious consideration in, in, within the Scottish Government. Would anyone like to follow up with a quick supplementary on any of that? I think we'll, we'll move on to another theme, which was at the last committee meeting we had, we took very, very good evidence. Um, and it was noted that things are never as simple as they first of all seem. So perhaps if you had some kind of sexual bullying, uh, there may be other factors related to that. And I know that Faria uh, has a particular interest in that. And please... Thank you, convener. Yep, so just to move the conversation along to intersectionality, um, does the panel think that more could be done to equip schools with the tools they need to prevent the effects of sexual harassment alongside other forms of abuse and discrimination experienced by marginalised groups in the school environment? It's Phil. Very good question. Um, as a so, so my team leads on work to, um, is to, to promote inclusive education for all protected characteristics within schools. Um, and we're working very closely with um, the Thai campaign, um, Stonewall Scotland, LGBT youth, um, on, a, on work to how, well, how, how do we um, get that promotion of LGBTI, inclusive education within schools. And we're, we're still um, going through the process. Um, but we're looking at how um, teachers can be supported through um, career, career professional development um, training courses, but also how can we help teachers um, before they become teachers at the initial teacher education stage. Um, and we're looking at how um, elements of the curriculum can be strengthened as well to provide um, teachers with more resources to have the, the confidence and, and to be comfortable in dealing, uh, teaching. Um, LGBTI issues to, to children and young people in Scotland. Um, so, so the work of the, of the group is still going on and we're hoping that will report before the end of this year. Um, and obviously it, it will tie into the sort of outcomes of the PSE review as well. 
and I think the PSE review um, will um, s identify what's happening in, in Scottish schools at the at present and will set out a, a way forward that we can then present to ministers and, and to um, other members of the parliament for, for consultation and, and input. So I think the, there's, there's, a, there's a number of different elements of work that are going on which will all hopefully come together at the end. That's certainly my intention, which will certainly go some way to, to meet the, um, the aims of this committee. I know that Hannah has a related question. Oh, there she is. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask, what plans are there to continue or expand support to third sector organisations that provide vital support and services to young people, particularly those who experience sexual harassment as well as racial harassment or abuse on the basis of sexual orientation uh, or related issues? Trevor. Um, I think I'll cover uh, I'll cover a couple of points, and and hopefully I also have the hate crime lead, um, so I can for the moment, um, so I can touch uh, I can touch on that your second point as well. Um, I think um, the the role the uh, third sector special frontline specialist services play um, in supporting people um, who have experienced gender based violence. Um, is a really important one, um, and we um, have invested a significant amount of resources um, in supporting local women's aid, AIDS and rape crisis centres um, over the past, um, uh, well, for, for, for many years, in fact. Um, at present, we have a, a dedicated rape crisis fund, um, which invests, um, it is 2.1 million um, over um, this current three-year period um, to support the operation of a number of local rape crisis centres um, across the country. Um, there's, been quite, um, there's been quite a bit of debate um, and discussion recently about the, um, I suppose, the capacity of these services um, to meet the current demand. And I think particularly as a sort of hark back to like, the events of last year um, and the Me Too campaign, it's in, in some sense has really helped um, to raise awareness around this issue, about helping people to understand um, better that um, this type of behaviour is completely unacceptable. Um, and I think those um, those services have been under some pressure. So we are in discussion um, at the moment with those services um, about how we can better support them um, to meet the demand that is out there to access their services. Um, you've touched on a slightly um, different issue as well. Um, and it's about, I suppose, supporting people to um, report um, racial, um, racial based crimes and um, discrimination on the basis of their sexual orientation. Um, we're currently taking forward a separate piece of work um, to look at um, reporting of hate crime. Um, and uh, that is, I think it's something that uh, is recognised um, as a real challenge in terms of raising awareness around the issue of hate crime um, and addressing issues around under-reporting. Um, so we're, we're engaging with <coughs> Police Scotland and third sector organisations to explore um, strengthening, I suppose, pathways for people who experience, and experience hate incidents, as we might call them, um, and think about, I suppose, the wider infrastructure out there in terms of there's a number of third sector organisations that do provide that support, um, but there's work to be done, I think, to strengthen that and deepen that. Um, but I suppose also um, there's been a lot of debate and discussion around hate crime legislation, and you may be aware that um, <coughs> ministers commissioned um, Lord Brackadale, um, a, a former ju a retired judge, to take forward a review, an independent review into hate crime legislation, um, and that will be um, reporting shortly. And I suppose that looks across the different um, characteristics, but also considers issues around gender as well. Um, so that I think that's something this committee, um, depending on what stage you're at, um, by the time Lord Brackadale reports, and that's imminent, um, you'll be quite interested, I think, in what comes out of that. Uh, I know Faria wants to come back in, if you would please, and I think Katie has a supplementary she'd like to ask, so Faria and then Katie. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask Phil, so we found through our focus groups that in cities particularly such as Glasgow, um, much of the sexual harassment and gender-based violence had racial undertones. Um, is there any research or work being done um, around that just to consider how that would affect young girls in schools similarly but maybe differently? Um, I'm not aware of any. I'm sorry. 
in KTN, but that is fairly specific. Is yours related, Katie? Yes, it's related to third sector. Um, Phil, you actually mentioned or touched upon this just earlier. Um, back off uh, Hannah's question, it's how do you share best practice with the third sector um, and charities that are delivering these services? And if you could give us an example of how you share best practice, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, I think we'll go back to Phil to respond directly to Faria's point. And uh, perhaps all of you would have something to say on Katie's point briefly. Phil. Sure. Um, I'm not aware of any research um, that's been specifically undertaken on that issue. Um, but we, um, well, c colleagues um, in, in Trevor's unit have um, commissioned specific guidance for um, to be developed or written by the Coalition for Racial Equality. Um, and uh, that's focusing, um, give a specific resource for teachers on how they, um, how they can address um, incidents of uh, racial and, and potentially xenophobic bullying within schools. Um, that, that resource is still being developed at the moment, but we're hoping that that will be um, available for schools in time for the new school term in August. Um, but that's the, re the re specific research on that. I'm, I'm not aware of any, but that's certainly something we could consider. Um, with regard to um, sharing best practice, um, a lot of the best practice is available through Education Scotland's National Improvement Hub, which is available to everyone. So it's available to everyone in, in this room. And there's also the um, GLOW network, which is available specifically for, for teachers. Um, how we share um, best practice with um, third sector organisations, we um, publish a lot of our, our guidance on the Scottish Government website, which is freely available to, to anyone to access. Um, and obviously we have um, uh, national groups such as the, the Scottish Advisory Group on Relationships, Behaviours in, in Schools, where we, we do have third sector bodies represented on the table. And we, we use these groups as a, as a way of sharing best practice as well. Um, there's also the um, annual Scottish Learning Festival, which um, Education Scotland um, hold, which is a two-day two festival um, at the SECC in Glasgow. And that has um, a, a vast number of different um, uh, seminars, hubs, um, and um, just sharing best practice that's been undertaken across the country. Um, so that's, and that's free, and it's not only open to teachers, but it's open to, to anyone to attend as well. So there's a number of different ways that we try and share best, best practice. Um, obviously, it's key that we get that best practice out there. From an inequalities and a cohesion um, point of view, Trevor, the third sector? Um, <clears throat> sure, and, and I think particularly in our neck of the woods, um, the third sector are an absolutely critical partner. Um, and I suppose I'll just touch on um, just touch on a couple of, um, I suppose, important partnerships we've got. Um, we, um, we provide funding to Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland, um, I suppose to act as a national, um, act as national bodies um, for these respective sectors and part of their role is to I suppose disseminate um, good practice amongst their own member groups which will be local women's aids and rape crisis centres and um, also I suppose um, support and uh, lobby government in relation to national policy which I think is, it's, is a really important space and they bring a tremendous amount of expertise um, that's informed by uh, you know informed by um, a whole range of factors to that, and that includes the direct experience, I think, of, um, of individuals who have experienced these issues. Um, I suppose the one other thing that we fund is of relevance um, is the improvement service to coordinate what we call the National Violence Against Women Partnership Network. Um, now, we expect each local authority to have a violence against women partnership um, within their area. Um, we support that, I suppose, nationally with, in terms of building capacity through the Improvement Service. And um, we also publish guidance with COSLA. And I think that that is a really helpful way, I think, to disseminate um, good practice amongst the third sector, but also to ensure that third sector 
um, and indeed statutory services, including local authorities, um, are working in partnership to address these issues. And I think Phil helpfully touched upon you know, the really important role of the third sector in talking about involving organisations like Rape Crisis Scotland and Zero Tolerance in shaping and developing this work. Um, and there's a real appetite for that, and we are con committed to continuing to support it. Now, I know we, um, we already discussed direction, guidance, national, local, etc., and schools. Uh, the conversation's moved on a bit from there, and I know Haley has particular questions around that she would like to ask. So I wanted to ask the committee um, whether there's currently enough um, national guidance given to schools and teachers that set out clearly um, what should be done to address sexual harassment. Um, I think specifically how to distinguish between incidents that are perceived as bullying and, and criminal behaviour. Um, we've heard a little bit about equally safe, respect for all in the child protection framework, but just about this distinction and what guidance is given to, to staff and schools. Phil. Um, respect for all, um, I, as you said, does provide that, that specific guidance for, for schools and teachers, but it also um, uh, points teachers and, and schools to um, get in contact with Respect Me. So that's the, the organisation that we fully fund and they provide, um, um, they'll provide a national um, uh, assistance to, to everyone who works with children and young people to provide specific clear advice on, on these issues, but also to provide uh, training, but not just for teachers, but also for parents as well. So they've recently started um, offering uh, training sessions for parents, which have been really well received and, and very popular. Um, the question of um, enough national guidance, it's a, it's a very tricky one to answer. Um, as I said at the start, the curriculum is, is a broad framework. We don't, we're not prescriptive. We don't tell schools what they can and what they can't teach, which is a, a very different approach to um, England and Wales. Um, so it is, it is really up to um, schools and local authorities to, to set what, what their kids will need to, need to understand and, and what will be part of their learning package. But um, I think when it comes to guidance, if, if we get views from teachers, from third sector organisations, that the guidance that they have at, at the moment isn't enough, then obviously that's something we, we would uh, look at in the future. I think I meant more that the, the teachers and schools were able to distinguish between incidents rather than the young people themselves um, in terms of addressing incidents of sexual harassment. Um, I th again, I think that would come down to um, the, the guidance that's, that comes from, uh, from my team as well as the guidance that comes from uh, Trevor's team as well. Um, and. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that specifically s sets out what you should do in the instance of a sexual harassment. Um, uh, so I'm not aware of that, but there is general guidance on what to do and when to involve um, Police Scotland. So obviously there's, um, uh, most secondary schools have campus officers um, liaised with the school. So there'd be, a, uh, there'd be kind of child protection procedures within, in place within every school, and we would expect the teachers to follow those child protection procedures if there was an instance of um, sexual harassment so that they could ascertain whether it did cross over into criminal behaviour or whether it is, um, could be viewed as bullying behaviour. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. I would agree. I think, um, I think in terms of the child protection national guidance and the training that's given to teachers that have that particular role and those officials within schools, I think there is a, a clear understanding in that guidance about what constitutes something that should be escalated as a criminal matter, um, whether or not there is clear guidance in the child protection guidance about what constitutes harassment and how to deal with it. I mean, I, I would have to say that, no, I don't think there is in, in that particular suite of guidance. I'm not as familiar with the, the guidance that Phil is referring to. Um, but I think in terms of those professionals discharged with a child protection function, they would have a clear idea. But the broader teachers, as I say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not clear what guidance is there in terms of the general s the support across the piece. Yeah, that certainly sounds, Haley, like something worth probing further. Yeah. 
Good. Uh, we're almost at the end of our session, uh, but there's a, a catch-all question that's, that's coming from Sarah that um, I would ask you all to be very honest. <laughs> and um, if we could have a, a fairly um, quick response um, from all of you, that would be useful. Sarah. Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, given the sort of breadth of uh, the topics discussed, um, do you as officials feel that there's any further support that Scottish Government could provide to help schools tackle the evident problem of sexual harassment, given that it does affect the vast number of, of young women and girls in Scotland? Phil. Um, yes. Um, I think we... No. <laughs> Is that the time? No. Um, um, that's when I said at the start I want my team to uh, review the, the current guidance that was drafted in 2014. Um, I think it needs to be brought up to date. Um, times have changed. Um, the, the technology that's available to um, young people is very different to what was available in 2014. Um, I think we're. I think it is the, the the prevalence of mobile technologies in schools which is driving a lot of this, um, and we are. Um, I mean, we do have um, sort of general guidance available to to schools to follow, but I think on the on the aspect of how we address sexual harassment, I think it's something that needs to be brought into this uh, the guidance that we're going to review. Dina. I, I would say yes as well, um, and perhaps just um, provide a, a bit of statistical background. Um, the Cabinet Secretary um, commissioned a piece of research to look at why um, sexual offending was rising, and there was a particular category of other sexual crime. Um, so looking more in depth at those figures, um, it really did, I think, give us a, quite a stark um, insight into who was driving these figures up, and it was young, young people, both as, as victims and as perpetrators. So if I could just provide some details on that. So um, the victims of uh, reported sexual offending were disproportionately female, especially younger women and children. Um, what we could tell from the stats was at least 44% of the sexual crimes recorded in 2016-17 uh, related to a victim under the age of 18. And the vast majority of perpetrators of sexual crimes are men, although increasingly the proportion of perpetrators, especially in cyber-enabled other sexual crimes, are themselves under 18. So I think from a Scottish Government perspective, um, that was a real... Um, insight into what behaviours are actually driving the sexual offending figures up and I suppose what I'm trying to say is we didn't really know that before because we hadn't done that exercise and um, of course third sector may have been bringing it to our attention but having the statistics and um, to show that is is really significant for the Scottish Government um, and I think um, you know that, that led to the expert group on um, prevent, preventing sexual offending um, in children and young people. And, and that group, as Sandra said, are, are due to report, I think, next spring. Um, and that will be, I think, really informative for the Scottish Government in terms of what next steps it takes. And certainly, I, I imagine some of that, or, or quite a lot of that, um, will be recommendations about how we can support schools further. I have quick comments from Sandra and then Trevor, please. Just to add my time's worth, really, yes, I also agree um, wholeheartedly. I think that as we become more aware of the different threats and have a greater understanding of threats that we've already known about, then um, the government has a responsibility to take leadership around some of these areas, or certainly indicate its intent around, uh, around these areas. And so um, I don't think we can ever pull the drawbridge up and say, that's it, job done. Um, it's going to be an awful long time before that, if, if ever that's the case. Um, so there's always the need for us to continue to work with third sector partners, young people themselves, organisations and committees such as this to look at what we're doing and develop new responses as the natures of the threats develop. So, um, yeah, far from job done. I think there's lots still to do. Yeah. Trevor. Um, absolutely, there is more to be done. Um, schools don't exist in a vacuum. They exist, obviously, within broader society and sexual harassment continues to be a significant issue in broader society. Um, and I think our focus really needs to be 
um, you know, how we change those attitudes and we tackle those inequalities that create the conditions for sexual harassment and other forms of gender-based violence to flourish. We're really ambitious in this area, but we recognise it's a multi-generational task that we've got ahead of us. But we've made, it feels like we've made a huge amount of progress in recent times, and we, we, we really want to continue, and I think we can always be doing more and better. I would like, on behalf of everyone here, to thank all of you on the panel. I, I think your responses were excellent and very, very much appreciated. Thank you very, very much for taking part. Uh, I'd like to everyone to look at, it's actually item one in the agenda, um, but I forgot to do it earlier on. <laughs> um, we need a decision from this committee as to whether to take um, item three in private. Item three being your draft report and the committee having to consider that report. Can we have agreement to take that in private? You have to shout, you can't just not. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We will take that in private. Before that, I'd like to thank everyone who has contributed to the inquiry. And I would like Alexandra, as a deputy convener, to say a few words at this point. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say it sounds like there's a lot of good work being done between the panel and the third sector. Um, really, the question is, as, as Trevor alluded to earlier, um, how we come together to deliver consistent breast practice, because we do have a collective responsibility. Um, but just very quickly, on the third and final committee session, um, on behalf of the Young Woman Lead Committee, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank YWCA Scotland, the Scottish Parliament, and specifically Linda Fabiani for providing us with the space to discuss <laughs> such an important issue and uh, to promote women's participation in Scottish politics. Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Alexandra. It's the intention that the report will be published on 31st of May and it will be available on the Young Women's Movement website. We'll now move into a private session to agree that final report. And can I ask everyone who's not in the committee to please clear the room? <laughs>